Hello and welcome to the third video for the first module on fractions. Today we're going to be talking about fractions, decimals, and percentages, and in general the way of expressing numbers, since numbers have many many expressions for the same number. So let's start there. Um, consider the number 4. I've written on the slide for this video six different ways of essentially expressing the same number. Think of it just as sort of an ordinary integer. Uh, think of it as a decimal with zeros at some precision. Um, the zero with a bar usually means repeating, so think of it as four with infinitely many zeros behind it. Uh, we think of it as fraction four over one, likewise it could be a fraction 12 over three or any other equivalent fraction. You can even think of it in other sort of interesting forms like the square root of 16 is also four. The point being, there's lots of different ways of expressing numbers. And whenever we're using mathematics, we have to make choices about how we're writing our numbers. And those choices mean something. And so what we want to talk about a little bit in this video is how to express numbers, how to go between them, what different expressions of numbers mean, which ones are valuable in certain contexts. So let's start with decimals and fractions. So we can express most fractions as decimals, we express most decimals as fractions, we can go back and forth between them. So let me start here with this decimal 5.098. Uh, and what decimals mean are fractions over powers of 10, hence hence the term decimal, which comes from the Latin root dec for, uh, for 10. So 5.098 is 5 and 98 one thousandths. So that's to the third decimal point is 10 to the 3 is 1,000. So we can think of that equivalently as the fraction 5098 over 1,000. And if there are more, more decimal places, we would have higher powers of 10. Uh, we can reduce that fraction if we want. So that happens that 5098 and 1000 share a factor of 2. If we divide by 2, divide numerator and denominator by 2, which is sort of the fraction, we get 25 to 99 over 500. So in terms of lowest terms, 5.098 expressed as a fraction is 2599 over 500. And any other decimal I could express as a fraction this way, just writing it as a fraction over power of 10 and reducing if I feel so inclined. Going the other way is a little bit more complicated. I'm not going to get into the algorithm how to do that in these modules. It's not something I want to review, but there is a general way of taking a repeating fraction like this, 0 0.3636, so forth and so on. We often write repeating fractions as a bar, so 0 0.36 bars, notation for 363636 on forever. There is a way of turning this into a fraction which I'm not going to review here, but just know that it does exist um, for any repeating decimal, and the repeating is important. For non-repeating decimals, it doesn't exist. And what do I mean by a non-repeating decimal? Well, if you look at the decimal expansion for the square root of 2, you get a string of digits that starts with 1.4142, so forth and so on. And in that string of digits, you will never find a repeating pattern. You'll never find a sequence of digits such that the entire fraction is the same thing then repeat it over and over and over again. There's no such pattern um, in the square root of 2. And that's because the square root of 2 is an irrational number. Irrational numbers are numbers which cannot be expressed as fractions, can only be expressed approximately in terms of decimals. And, and the real numbers are split up into these two classes. You have rational numbers, things are expressed as fractions, and you have irrational numbers, things that are not expressed as fractions. And in terms of decimals, Rational numbers are always repeating fractions. That's why any repeating fraction or repeating decimal can be turned into a fraction. And irrational numbers are non-repeating decimals. So you've got this complete separation into fractions, repeating decimals, irrationals, non-fractions, non-repeating decimals. This leads into the idea of approximate value. Particularly for irrational numbers, we can't write exactly what these things are in decimal notation because there's a string of digits that goes on forever, and if you truncate it, then you approximate it. So we talk in mathematics about exact values and approximate values, and both are very, very useful and both have their appropriate place to be used. And doing mathematics well involves making a choice of when do I work with exact values, when do I work with approximate values. So by exact values, I refer to the symbols that stand for the whole number. So if I write the symbol pi or the symbol square root 7, that symbol means exactly the number pi in all its infinite complexity, exactly the number root 7 in all its infinite complexity. There's no loss of information. 
However, if I want to do certain kinds of arithmetic, it's very, very useful to have a decimal expansion for these things. So pi is approximately 3.1415, root 7 is approximately 2.65. These are approximate values. They're not exact. Uh, pi is not exactly 3.1415. It has other terms that adjust it, but this is you know up to four decimals accurate, which is good for a lot of purposes. So for a lot of applied mathematics, for a lot of measurement, for a lot of things we actually have to do in the world, it's going to be more valuable to have approximate values. This is balanced by the fact that when you calculate with approximate values, and I'm not going to get into the details of that here, but when you calculate with approximate values, you tend to lose precision the more calculations you do. There's error in an approximate value. So the error in here is less than 1 in 10,000. The error here is less than 1 in 100. But if you do a bunch of arithmetic, a bunch of calculations with approximate value, that error grows. And after even a small number of calculations, 5 or 10, the error can become very, very large to the point that your calculation is entirely useless. So in those cases, we want to use exact values as long as we can and do the approximations as late as possible so we don't run into the problem of error propagation. That's not something we're explicitly going to work on in these modules, but something you should be aware of, and it is the reason for using exact values. You might think that approximate values are always better because they're, they give you a better sense of what the number is, but the prop problem of error propagation really inspires us to work with exact values when we can. Some notation here, um, when we write a number and an approximate value, I don't want to just use the ordinary equal sign. Equal signs means actually equal, exactly the same as. So I want to use a different notation to indicate that I'm making an approximation. And there are two common notations which I've written here, equals with a dot and equals with a squiggle. Those are both very common notations for approximately equal to. So I really encourage you when you use approximate values to use one of these two notations. And now hopefully you can also recognize these when they come up as approximation notations. If you do a calculation with exact values, you might end up with a sort of complicated expression in exact values. And this expression is good in terms of a calculation. There's no loss in terms of error. But it's not a good expression for just looking at it and saying, well, how much is that? Pi squared plus 7 root 53 over 2. I can't look at that and have a really good guess of roughly where that is. Uh, I would probably guess it's larger than 10 and less than 100, but I can't really guess any more accurately than that. Um, whereas if we go to approximate values, and I asked your computer for this, um, it's approximately 45.9, which gives me a sense of the magnitude of the number. So at the end of the day, doing an approximation, giving, giving yourself a decimal expansion, gives you a much better concrete handle on how large the number you've produced is. The last thing I want to talk about in this video is percentages. We've talked about fractions and decimals. Percentages are another closely related, closely connected type, type of way of writing numbers. And percentages, again, from the Latin uh, percent uh, for, uh, per 100, for 100 out of 100, implicitly means fractions out of 100. So 47% is just a fancy way of saying 47 over 100, same thing as 0 0.47. Um, because of our decimal-based system, things out of 10, things out of 100 are sort of special. So we have a nice term for them, percentages. Uh, if you have a fraction and you want to write it as a percentage, you write its decimal expansion and you truncate it wherever you want. Again, this is an approximate equals because 3 over 17 is a repeating decimal. It's not exactly 0 0.1764. It's an infinite repeating decimal. So I've approximated it as 0 0.1764. And out of 100, that's 17.64%. So out of 100, I can shift, just shift the decimal place two places over and write this as 17.64%. And again, this is 3 17ths is approximately equal to 17.64%. Going the other way is even easier. We just take what we have and write it as a fraction over 100. If it has decimal points, we can write it as a fraction over 1,000 or 10,000, however far we need to go with the decimal points. But if it's a straight percentage, we write it as a fraction over 100, which we can reduce if we wish. 48% is 48 over 100, and you reduce that, divide by 4, numerator and denominator, you get 12 over 25. So 48% as a fraction is 12 25ths. 
The last thing I want to mention here is it's often useful to calculate percentage change. So if I have two values, A1 and A2, I go from the value A1 to the value A2 over a period of time. You can say, well, what's the percentage change? What percentage have we increased or decreased? This happens all the time for percentage growths. Um, how much has population changed? How much has money changed? How much has all sorts of other things changed? People want to know what the percentage growth is of various values over a day, over a month, over a year, over some kind of time span. So it's very, very common that we want to calculate percentage change. So I thought I would review the way that works. So percentage change is we take the difference uh, where we ended up minus where we started. So how much we've increased or decreased. Uh, we divide by where we've started. So we want that as a part of our starting value. So the difference divided by the starting value. And then since we want a percentage, we multiply by 100. A percentage is over 100, so to get a percentage, you multiply by 100. Let's be explicit about that. Let's say we have a population that has 154,244, and it grows in a time period, a year, say, to 157,934. We want to say in that year, what is the percentage change? How much has the population grown? So we take the ending value, subtract the starting value. Uh, that'll be positive because this has grown. It's grown from 154,000 to 157,000. That's growing up. So since this has increased, we expect that to be positive. If it had decreased, we expect it to be negative. We divide by the starting value. So it's the starting value here. Um, and we multiply by 100. And I asked a computer for an approximate value for this, and it gave me 2.39. So the percentage growth from 154,244 to 157,934 is 2.39 percentage points of growth.